think we got Zoidberg, we got Pavel, we got Roger, and then Quibbs. Okay, cool. It looks like everyone's here. Great. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. This is episode two, as I mentioned, of Inside the Xanoverse. Um, you have a few team members here, along with a special guest, as you can see, Roger Ver, to discuss the latest developments of Xano, uh, the new Zarkonum release, and um, some other privacy topics that um, are of interest. So my name is Nightman. I'm a crypto enthusiast, a privacy advocate, uh, NFT collector, etc. I'm excited to host the conversation tonight. Uh, we've got a great group of people. Um, we've got some really cool people from the Xano team and Roger, obviously. So um, let me start by introducing some of the members from the Xano team uh, who will be on the call here with us tonight. So we have Crypto Zoidberg. He's one of the co-founders, uh, Andre. Yeah, hi, everyone. And then we have Pavel. He is Ravaga. Ravaga. I don't know how we say that. He's also a co-founder. And then, Morning, everyone. Yeah, that's fine. You can go with whatever. Yeah, Pavel. And then Mr. Quibbs, he's on the main account. I don't know if he'll be able to speak as much, but he's a, he's right here with us. Hey, guys. Yes, I'm here. Sweet. And I believe that's everyone from our team. And then our guest tonight is none other than Roger Ver. Uh, Bitcoin Jesus, he's an early Bitcoin investor and uh, advocate for the space. He's got a ton of knowledge, so I'll let him uh, give a short intro, but I'm sure we all know who he is. But welcome, Roger. Thanks for joining us tonight. Can you guys hear? I can't hear anything. Roger is here. I'm not sure if it's my technical difficulties. Um, let me see. No, me either. I think it's a mic issue. Okay, we'll give him a couple minutes. But we're excited. We're um, got a lot of things coming down the pipe for Zeno. Um, there's some really cool releases coming up that I'm just going to open the doors for so much adoption and innovation um, in the privacy space and in general because. It's a crucial tool that crypto needs. So um, we're excited to get Roger's thoughts and opinions on kind of what attracted him to the project and some of the cool things we're all looking forward to. So we'll get him up here soon. Zoyberg, how are you? How's it going? Yeah, everything is cool. A little bit uh, early here in our place, but everything is cool. Nice. Very nice. Glad to have you. Last week we had some issues with travel. Um, yeah. Few timing issues, but this, luckily this time, uh, well, actually, we still have some issues. It seems like Mr. Quibb was on a boat that uh, hit some rocks or something, so oh, he's wow. a, a little delayed, but you know, not the end of the world. It looks like we got it. Invited. Yeah. Up. There we go. Yeah, I was supposed to um, to be on the ferry uh, yesterday, but the ferry here. Hit the war, <laughs> and I think people can hear me now. Made a big gap, there? and yes, sir. Welcome, fantastic. Robert. Yes. Yeah, I had to enable the the microphone access for my uh, Twitter app on this phone. So, um, nice. and as I was going to thank you for the uh, introduction, and you said that most people maybe know who I am, but if we want Zeno and cryptocurrency to grow, we need to bring new people into the cryptocurrency ecosystem who know nothing about you know Bitcoin, Bitcoin or Zano or myself or, or anything at all for that matter. And let's bring them up to speed and, and show them why this is all really exciting technology and why uh, uh, I'm doing this, uh, you know, event around Zano. Because uh, a lot of people that are already in crypto more recently know me for my Bitcoin advocacy. Uh, I'm sorry, Bitcoin Cash advocacy, and before that, my advocacy for for Bitcoin or just you know all things crypto in general. But uh, I'm really excited to see so many people with open minds and, and on the call here. Yeah, thank you for that. And you're right. You know, we kind of get sometimes in our little ecosystem, we don't realize. Um, that we all were new at one point and we all were trying to figure out what was going on and sitting in these spaces, just trying to uh, learn and hear from people and kind of more natural conversations about what to make sense of this whole thing. So uh, good point there. So just uh, if you guys don't know, Roger is one of the first investors in Bitcoin. He kind of found it early on and helped support the ecosystem. So he's been around through multiple, multiple cycles. He's seen it all. Um, and he just kind of is a, a thought leader in the space. So it's really, it's really awesome that we have him to share his thoughts on kind of the current state of the market, uh, Zeno, privacy coins in general, um, the ecosystem and the, the political climate, everything has shifted so much in the last 10 years that 
um, your insight here is very valuable. So appreciate you joining us tonight. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I would love to give my, my thoughts as to why Zeno has uh, caught my attention as well, because I think a lot of people wonder who's this, you know, Bitcoin guy and then Bitcoin cash and, you know, now Zano and this and that. And so like, I think the, the, the value proposition is pretty, pretty simple, actually. So if we look at the very first cryptocurrency that got traction was Bitcoin. And in the early days of Bitcoin, everybody thought Bitcoin was completely anonymous. Turns out not even remotely close to being uh, anonymous at all. And then we saw, you know, people were using Bitcoin for things they thought were, you know, had some privacy, were like these dark net markets. But more recently, everybody in the dark net markets, they're not really using Bitcoin anymore. They're using uh, privacy coins, uh, namely Monero is the biggest one. And then later we saw all these, you know, smart contract platforms and, you know, Ethereum being the most famous, but there's a whole bunch of other, you know, EVM compatible chains out there competing for that space. But the thing that everybody on those platforms is using more than anything else are tokens. And everyone's using tokens on top of Ethereum and everything else there and Tron and blah, 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 blah. Tokens, tokens, tokens. Everyone's using tokens for things. But if you look at it, none of those tokens have any sort of privacy at all. Like you're completely exposed to you know, anybody with a block explorer to being able to, to take a look at what you're doing with those tokens. And that brings us to Zano because it's about to launch a privacy token platform. And so we saw cryptocurrency go from Bitcoin with no privacy to Monero with lots of privacy. And now we see these token platforms with no privacy. Well, what's the next step of that? We're going to see tokens with privacy. And I think Zano is in a, in a good position to be that privacy token platform. And that's what caught my attention with that. And it's not to say it's, it's guaranteed to be the winner or it's going to be the only one, but it's certainly one of the contenders out there and has a really you know fantastic dev team for a lot of people that don't know out uh, there. The people that coded up Zano are the same people that coded up uh, Monero the original time around. I think Cryptozoid Bear can speak to that in even more detail in his history there. But I think that's a real, real strong indication uh, there of, of this being a powerful team and uh, powerful stuff. And uh, I'm excited to see privacy tokens come out there to the world. Like people would much rather use privacy tokens than non-private tokens, just like we've seen people rather to use privacy coins than, than non-private coins for their, their e-commerce uh, transactions. I mean, yeah, that makes so many good points there. Um, at the beginning, like the killer app was that anonymous coin since the anonymous, the anonymity of it. Um, and that's kind of faded since then because of the hype and the money and this and that. But the core value, there's a lot there that, that we're missing. So that does bring us to our next question um, for the Xano team. Could you give the brief, the listeners a brief intro on Xano, the, the story behind it, the mission behind the project and what uh, what kind of keeps you guys working at this thing so long? I could probably take this one. As Roger already told the general narrative about us being a payment method, but I could add some more details to it. Um, originally, CryptoNode protocol was the one that intended to fix Bitcoin. There was no narrative of, of privacy coins back then. It was just coins, but with CryptoNode, they tried to make it untraceable because it's a fungibility issue and one coin should always be equal to another. And this is how it originally started. Later then, uh, Zoidberg launched the Bulbury, solving a bunch of more issues like blockchain bloat and make it ISIC resistant to make it more egalitarian. Then in 2019, I, I think we launched Stana, adding even more uh, value in the direction of um, digital cash. It was an uh, encrypted attachment. We introduced a uh, hybrid proof of work, proof of stake algo, which is, I would admit, is very important because nowadays it's more about proof of stake and the idea of being more eco friendly. And finally, our newest release, Zarganum, brings a uh, hidden amount proof of stake, which is another big deal and we had a paper on it and obviously the confidential assets the privacy tokens yeah thanks for sharing that that was um some of the things i was going to talk about next we have confidential assets we have the the ring signature we have a lot of these cool features that that are coming out with the new zarkonum release um that are just going to help kind of bring out this this vision that everyone's been looking for for so long of of confidential decentralized uh, apps um can you tell us a little bit more about the other features that are coming with Zarkano besides the first private POS scheme? Um, maybe explain some of the other things with Ionic swaps and with with uh, the implementation of Ring CT. Yeah, I guess that's the Andrew's fun because he loves Ionic swaps. 
uh, yeah, kind of. Well, uh, first of all, I just want to make it clear what is Arcanum, uh, because we uh, we created a little bit of confusion. Uh, originally, Zarkanum, the paper that uh, we called Zarkanum, described uh, proof of stake on top of hidden amounts. It was a really big thing, big improvement, and uh, like uh, we were really excited about this. But also with uh, proof of stake on top of hidden amounts, we bringing uh, confidential assets. That's that's. Uh, absolutely different technology, but it goes together with Arcanum on the next hard fork. So now we call both proof of, uh, proof of stake on top of hidden amount and uh, confidential sets. We, we we both call it Arcanum because it both goes with the same hard fork. So yeah, it's two different technologies. Uh, we just bring it bring it together. It's it's really it's a really huge upgrade. We basically uh, re-implemented almost everything, uh, wallet and the core. It's, it's huge work. We're a little bit stressed with this because uh, it's a huge upgrade and we are a little bit stressed that something will uh, will will go not as it planned after hard fork, but uh, still we are positive about this. Hopefully everything will be fine. Um, also, yes, yeah, as, uh, as uh, was mentioned, Ionic swaps. Ionic swaps actually is not something uh, completely insane or uh, absolutely new. The the technology was idea of this technology was in the in the air, and uh, I think ideas of this. Um, Swaps was uh, also said by different people because we last year we were on a conference on the Prague, uh, Manier conference in Prague, and uh, in in uh, what is the name of this place, Pavel? Do you remember? Uh, well, Crypt I don't. It's the uh, uh, Institute of yeah. Crypt uh, Asset. Or crypto anarchy, crypt, yeah. Crypto something. So there was a guy who was uh, right, right. presenting almost the same technology that we use for Ionic Swap, and uh, like almost, but with the same idea. So it's very simple. Um, uh, atomic Swap, this technology was uh, invented like uh, ages ago, uh, and uh, it uh, involves four transactions. It and it actually, it's actually is not atomic. Uh, it takes four different steps to perform. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about uh, hash time locket uh, atomic swaps, hash time locket contracts. And um, it always gives a little bit of advantage to one of the sides. The the side that do the execution of the... when The, the side that do the third step, third transaction, it always has advantage. It think about execute or not execute it have some time so if you uh, in a situation of uh, high volatility when the price is jumping up and down so the one can do uh, some calculations and uh, make more profit from this and uh, ionic swap are is executed in one transaction, one single, single transaction, that the whole deal is uh, executed in one single shot. And uh, this simplicity uh, make it, I think it make it more effective. Uh, and um, we want to bring it uh, to people to build some liquidity inside ZANA. So one token can be exchanged to another token or to native ZANA with one single transaction. And um, yeah, that's cool. I, I, as, as was mentioned, I really like it. Uh, probably overly excited about this, but it's not perfect. Um, it's still we still have a problems, uh, not technical problems. It's a um, problem. Uh, the problem is that being a privacy project, we have a problems with uh, creating a matching algorithm. Because, <clears throat> for example, if you have a uh, some sort of like order book. Uh, if you make it public, if you make uh, or if you make some algorithm 
have access to these uh, offers and uh, bids, for example, you can see the you can see this part of those transactions, and then you can guess about uh, what actually transaction hold this Ionic swap transaction hold because you saw what was offered. So right now we building this as a peer to peer experience. So it will be look like if anyone had the experience with a Binance peer to peer or uh, local bitcoins where people basically find each other and then they make this deal. Uh, in, in, in this case, uh, when you look at the transaction, uh, you cannot see how much coins was exchanged, what type of coins exchanged to what of type of coins. Basically, all information is hidden. Yeah, that's um, that's a unique. If, I mean, if it's not clear, if a, it's a little bit uh, was too fast, uh, you can ask more questions about this. But and if if I can add a little bit to that, cryptozoid works like. Basically, what he's saying is that people will be able to trade all the different privacy tokens yeah. peer-to-peer yeah. on it. But it, it, we're working to make sure we maintain the privacy with that. Well, um, I see my long, long time friend Jesse Powell, the f- uh, founder and longtime CEO of Kraken until recently, uh, is on the call here. And I'll, I'll let Jesse know like what's interesting to me about Zeno. And J- Jesse was one of the very first people I ever spoke to Bitcoin about, uh, spoke to about Bitcoin. And at the time, everybody thought Bitcoin was was private. And then we watched people realize that Bitcoin wasn't private and they switched doing their e-commerce away from Bitcoin into things like Monero. And Kraken is one of the you know great uh, Western exchanges that lists Monero and has all sorts of other things. I trade on Kraken. It's been great. But J- then Jesse and I watched things like Ethereum come into existence where everybody was excited about tokens and doing tokens. And so just like I said earlier on the call and my, my investment thesis for Zeno here, we saw people go from non-private coins like Bitcoin into Monero. Okay. I think next we'll see people go from non-private tokens into privacy tokens, and the Monero, I'm sorry, the Zeno platform is looks like it's going to be a great platform for these privacy tokens. And while we're figuring out how to do the peer-to-peer trading for the Zeno tokens, well, centralized exchanges like maybe Kraken in the future will be right there, willing to to step up to the plate and uh, help enable these sorts of things as well. Because people, just like they prefer privacy coins to non-privacy coins, I think they'll prefer private tokens to non-private tokens. You don't need everybody in the entire world being able to see every single fin- financial transaction you make. And uh, glad to see uh, Jesse still in the space uh, here. Uh, I haven't talked to you for a while, Jesse, but nice to see you in here. Yeah, thanks for those comments. Very good insight. Um, so when you see Xana, when you see all these kind of native features that are coming out, um, is this stuff that you haven't seen with other projects and it's really stand out and that's, that's kind of what attracted you um, to the project or is this kind of give us and give the, the listeners a little bit of a context because uh, we're kind of layman. We don't see this. We don't see all of the new technology that comes out. We haven't seen maybe attempts at doing this in the past that haven't worked. And I'm sure you have a really good insight there. So kind of how does these, how do these features um, kind of help give Nano, I guess, uh, an edge against what you've seen in the past? Yeah, well, I, I think it's the same sort of thing. I bought my first Bitcoin when they were around a dollar each. I bought my first Monero when they were a little over a dollar each. Uh, Zeno is right there in the same position. It's about a dollar each right now. There's around 12 million of them. That means the entire market cap for all the Zeno in the entire world right now is around $12 million. But think about it. If, if Zeno and the team succeeds in building a really useful privacy token platform, all sorts of people are going to want to have privacy tokens, just like we've seen people want to use private cryptocurrencies rather than transparent cryptocurrencies. And so this is a really, really big opportunity. And one of the things being, you know, having come from the e-commerce space into cryptocurrency, using cryptocurrencies for commerce is super, super important to me. One of the projects that really caught my attention that's being built on Zeno is the Zeno Bazaar project, which is basically using the Zeno uh, escrow API and uh, platform to be able to buy and sell anything privately with Zeno right there in an uncensorable manner built right into everything. And I don't know who the best technical person to explain on the call is about how that works, but boy, did that ever catch my attention. Uh, e-commerce for me is what crypto was all about uh, to begin with. And so I'm excited to see that. And if there's someone else on here that can talk more about uh, Opa, Zeno Bazaar, uh, I'd love to hear more of the details about what's going on or what other exciting use cases for privacy tokens people see out there. We could invite Kexploit, the lead developer on Bazaar. We are in touch and uh, I know very well of the idea behind his project. Yeah, and I see lots of the my Bitcoin Cash friends have joined the, the, the I don't know, podcast or whatever we're calling the Twitter space here on X. Um, that doesn't mean I'm not a fan of Bitcoin Cash at all. Like, there's lots of great action happening there, but, like, 
you know, diversity uh, in experimentation in the cryptocurrency thing leads to, you know, at least one outcome that's going to be really, really useful to people uh, around the world. So let's have some uh, friendly competition and collaboration between all the different uh, cryptocurrencies out there, including Zano and Bitcoin Cash and, and everything else for that matter. Yeah, I don't see Kexploit in the audience or else we'd bring him up uh, to explain the, the Zano Bazaar project a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's still, like you said, that goes back to the core use case, the core thing that people are looking for. Um, and it just provides more sovereignty, more decentralization, which is kind of what we're all here for, um, enabling people to kind of operate how they want to uh, in a trustless environment. So um, I don't well, see in, that, in that case, I can get like a brief overview because I'm not familiar with like everything what he does because he is implementing Neem, I think, right now, and this is like way beyond my understanding of the project, but I can tell exactly what parts of Zana is being used for Bazaar. Like Exploit is working with the Zana Marketplace API that allows any Zana user to post their listings on top of blockchain, and also utilizing escrow contract that allow um, people trade using their Zana as collateral. And obviously, after their kind of hard work, they'll be um, they'll be using not only Zeno native coin, but any tokens working on top of Zeno blockchain. So, you know, for example, if you make a stable coin of Zeno, you can also trade using it because all uh, confidential assets possess the same functionality as the native coin. And then is Xano required or is Xano coin? Is that? Well, the, the main role of Xano coin is to pay for fees, but you can use any confidential asset, your own token. It works just the same. And then that's where the Ionic swaps come in, where there's a lot of flexibility with, um, with what you're actually doing. Yeah, Ionix is the technology that uh, powers the Xano-based decks that allow you to swap your asset in a single transaction. It, it's not like connected to Bazaar or any other project. It's just one of the features that could be used. Gotcha, gotcha. Thanks for that. Okay, cool. Um, let's see what else we got here. And I, I have a question for you know, Cryptozoidberg or Ravanga or some of the more technical people on here. Can, since I'm still a bit new to the space and, and reading everything I can about this, tell me more about the the, the scripting abilities and smart contracting abilities that the Zeno blockchain has built right in and how it compares to the different EVM chains and how they can interact. I know there's already wrapped Zeno on Ethereum and I think other EVM chains are possible too, but I'd, I'd love to hear more about how the, these different platforms co compare and contrast with each other. If someone can speak to that, I would love to hear it. Well, uh, we don't have a virtual machine in the sense like uh, Ethereum chain uh, because we don't have much to work with. We don't have addresses. We don't have amounts. So there is nothing to build a smart contract on in a general sense. What we got is some pre-built things like escrow contracts and tokens, uh, um, but we don't have the programmatical ability. And I believe we shouldn't even try to do that because it bulks up the chain and it should be transparent in certain sense for a smart contract to be a, like a real verifiable smart contract you should be able to see the source code otherwise you don't know what you are committing to and what we think we are going to do and we are already actually doing it we are building bridges and the wrapped center is just the early implementation of that but we are uh, building the bridge that would connect tokens, Xano, with a bunch of EVM-compatible chains, as well as Solana, Cosmos, and other ecosystems. So if you want to use the uh, smart contracts uh, for lending, borrowing, any sort of complex on-chain operations, you just bridge your Xano or tokens to Ethereum. And it could be... Not, not only Ethereum, just any EVM compatible chain. And you can bridge assets back to Zana, making them private. You can have a wrapped Ethereum and Zana and send it around and then convert it back. That's the general idea to make it interconnected with a bunch of chains. And how trustless or trusted is the interconnection between these different chains? Well, it's too early to tell, but obviously we're going to make 
it decentralized with no custody and no single key holder. It's something that we get in works. It hasn't been announced yet, but I believe in, in the following weeks, we will have a paper released that will explain it in greater details. Yeah, I can little add a little bit to this. Uh, yeah, we're working uh, on the uh, technology that uh, will... Um, it's, a, it's a technology where a group of people can uh, together generate a signature for, the, for some private key that do, does not exist. So they together generate a public key uh and this public key with this public key they they can sign some transaction but they can do it all only all together and uh the private key itself alone does not exist and so we want to build a so custody that will be safe because uh it's controlled not by the group of people not by the one person or some so it's not possible to steal it so to 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 sign some transaction, you have to have a, the, the the big group of people uh, that uh, actually can uh, all together generate uh, this uh, signature. And uh, similar technology was used in uh, RenBTC, the project RenBTC. If you are familiar with this, so we'll be using same same uh, tech, uh, cryptography as they did. Same same approach, I would say. Cryptography will be a little bit different. So yeah, in, yeah, it's trustless. And and I'd I'd love to ask a mildly off topic or maybe totally on topic, depending on your point of view. Question, probably for Cryptozoidberg here. So like recently, there have been some. And Cryptozoidberg, you were the guy who originally coded up the the uh, Monero software. Somebody else came up with the idea for CryptoNote, and I believe you're the guy who coded, actually did that coding to code it into reality. Yep. And recently, there have been quite a few accusations about uh, Fluffy Pony and exit scams and this and that. And we don't need to go into the details, but the, the question I have for you, just broadly speaking, and I've, I've watched what I think happened to Bitcoin. I wonder, do you think that there have been intentional bad actors within the Monero community trying to disrupt the protocol or maybe make it easier to de-anonymize it or, or basically doing things to prevent it from getting as much traction as it otherwise would have been and do you have any thoughts or insight onto that and the even harder question is do you have any ideas how to prevent that sort of thing from happening to design or other projects in in general uh sorry i didn't get the question you mean the someone of monero community was trying to de-anonymize the protocol of monero or what well so for example like it, it's it's public knowledge and not secret at all that the the nsa has intentionally tried to weaken various like open source like uh encryption technology so that they can have backdoors into what people are doing i think that that thing that same exact sort of thing happened within the ah. crypto uh bitcoin community i think it's probably happened within monero but since you were so deeply involved in monero very recently there have been some accusations about bad actors in monero intentionally trying to weaken monero and make it not as good and I, i'm wondering if you have any thoughts or opinions on if you think that did take place with Monero and if you have any ideas how we can make sure that that doesn't happen or less if it happens with Zano or, or other projects uh, in general because I think that's a real problem yeah. that hasn't really been addressed very openly in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Uh, first of all I'm not involved in Monero itself uh, and never been I just uh, been around uh, when was uh, when we created the code base and uh, by that time it wasn't Monero it was crypto node project they just uh, uses uh, use this code base, but in the project itself, Monero, I was never involved with myself, uh, except uh, tribal wars with Monero. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. It uh, could be a problem. We are uh, in Zana. We are quite small team, and we know each other for ages, like uh, way before Zana, and. Uh, it's uh, for a small team. It's probably easier to manage. Uh, Monero is a big, uh, big, huge project, and uh, I believe it's truly decentralized. And I have a lot of respect for that. It's really amazing how all all people like right now is new, and uh, it's all different people uh, who run Monero right now, and it's still doing pretty pretty much good. Um, I think Monero has a pretty big uh, community of developers and community of researchers who watch into the code and they have a um, 
sometimes uh, maybe not but mostly they have a very healthy technical discussions about uh, what they're doing what direction they're moving so they have a they have a, a lot of reviewers who uh, the manera as a technology has a lot of attention which is a really good thing so i think manera is in a quite safe zone even though some maybe maybe some people will be try may want to try to uh, compromise Manera protocol. I think uh, because of they have a pretty pretty big community of reviewers and researchers, they are in a quite safe zone from that perspective. To be fair, I, I think maybe my opinion differs a little bit. The, the bigger a community becomes, maybe the more off, the easier it becomes for some bad actor to slip in and start causing trouble and, and sowing discontent or, or or proposing bad ideas. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's true. I agree with this, but uh, it, from 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 other uh, perspective, there is more eyes uh, watching into this. Uh, and uh, whatever, for example, some bad actor trying to, for example, he trying to do some malicious commit that uh, do some weird stuff or trying to place backdoor in uh, some commit, but more eyes are watching every commit, uh, and uh, that will be questioned. Uh, by more people, more reviewers. Uh, that's that's how I think it may uh, help. But yeah, I agree with uh, things that you said that some people may be, uh, some malicious people may be very vocal. They can try to confuse uh, other people or uh, mislead other people. And uh, yeah, that's, that's also possible. I, actually, <laughs> I've been, uh, we've been trying to have a, we, we had a few discussions about uh, proof of stake and the importance of proof of stake. And they still have a, a bunch of people who believe in proof of work, even though technically it's uh, kind of proven, you can see the numbers, the cost of uh, double spend attack and uh, other stuff. But for some reason, they, uh, there is a group of people who believe in proof of work for, I mean, I don't know for no reason for for, for if you ask me, and they, uh, I mean, we can uh, interpret it as a malicious behavior too, probably, from some perspective. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's not simple. There is no simple answer to this. Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I'd love to hear from other people since I'm kind of on the the periphery of the Zeno community. What what other aspects are people excited about with, in regards to privacy tokens? So or or the Zeno platform itself, like the uh, Zeno Bazaar is interesting to me. I'd love to see you know various privacy stable coins out there, and then you know the more privacy people have in the world, the better is 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 my basic point of view. And I see Zeno as another tool to enable that. But what else are people excited about? I'd I'd love to hear and learn from others on the call. One thing I'm excited about is uh, I mean obviously the release is coming out. Um, but we're working on a grant program and something that'll allow the community to kind of engage a little bit more and incentivize them to build on it. And that kind of brings up what you were just saying. Um, we want to see some privacy coins. We want to see privacy stable coins. It'd be fun to see kind of different little implementations. So I'm excited to just see what everyone's going to build um, and specifically those type of programs that come out that kind of help build the community and build the ecosystem. Um, so those are some of the things that I'm excited about. What about you, Zoidberg? I think Ionic Swaps is the thing that you're most excited about. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Ionic Swap is just, um, I don't think uh, Ionic Swap itself is a, like a really big deal from technology perspective. Because... And for most of us, can, can you explain what exactly an Ionic Swap is and how that's different from an Atomic Swap or, or other swaps that we might be familiar oh, with? Oh, it's very or... simple. I, I, will, I, will, I will make a video that illustrate the whole operation. Uh, but, uh, for example, you have... Um, uh, for example, you have a USDT uh, that uh, circulates in Zana, yeah, uh, confidential token that represent USDT. I have, for example, uh, uh, Zana, or I have a, I don't know, Bitcoin Cash wrapped in Zana, and um, me and you, we want to exchange one to another, and uh, we want to do it like in a safe way. So, uh, and we, for example, right now it will be look like. We speak, spoke to each other and said, okay, let's do 
this uh, exchange with a given rate. Okay, we agree about rate and amount that we want. So it's very simple. You you go to your wallet. You just uh, say, I want to make a swap uh, with this amount. To I want to uh, exchange uh, this amount of uh, USDT to this amount of Bitcoin Cash uh, to this given address. Uh, address of the the counterparty uh the wallet generate you like a like a just a text uh, information encoded in hex and you send this this information is actually encrypted so you you can send it uh through whatever channel you want it no, no this that, that if if other other party can uh see this uh text they they not gonna read what is inside yeah right so you you send it to other party, this blob of uh, hex data, uh, and uh, uh, the, the later we will wrap it into some more convenient user interface. But right now, user experience could look like this: you send it to other party. Uh, he put this uh, text in, into the into the wallet, and the wallet decrypt everything uh, because he is a he is a receiver. Yeah, everything is encrypted on his address. He see the he, he sees the details of the deal that proposed so this amount exchange it into this amount of uh, uh, tokens and if he agree he just press the button execute it's one transaction coming out and that's it all the the, the, the deal is done you if you don't like you just ignore this and that's it so it takes uh, actually a few seconds uh, to to do the whole deal that's it uh, that's how Ionic Swap will work. The way that you said um, that this doesn't have like EVM support, but it does have some some bridges. So, will these bridges be able to be used by Ethereum apps or any EVM you know supported app, kind of as a privacy as a feature or add on? Like anyone could just start to bridge if they want to add privacy as some sort of their app. Would they be able to bridge to Xano, use that in order to achieve that and then kind of bridge back? Is that kind of how these bridges are going to work um, with that release? Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, well, actually, bridges are really important. Uh, we were thinking about this a lot because custody bridge is a weakness point uh, for, for, for all systems like that. And uh, we don't want to... Uh, we don't want to use this. Uh, and... Yeah, bridges in our case will be very important. We want to bring liquidity, bring uh, other to tokens from Ethereum. And uh, for that re reason, we will put a lot of efforts in, bringing, uh, in, in building a safe system that let us safely bridge uh, assets to, to Zana. And uh, the conception that we have right now, technologies that we come up right now, uh, let us bridge from uh, Bitcoin, from uh, Ethereum, and Ethereum-like systems uh, because the signature is uh, similar. And uh, yeah, probably we, we will manage to do the bridging with uh, Fira project. Hi, hi Ruben. I, I can see he's, he's around uh, in the audience here. And uh, probably that's it for, for now. Uh, the tokens that will be pre presented in the bridge will be limited. So it's not like any token from any network can be uh, bridged. You have to do uh, some maintenance to have one particular token. So you have to create a uh, uh, asset in, a, in, a, in ZANA that represents this token. And uh, in, you have to make this asset to be managed by group uh, of uh, of of people that control the bridge, some like I mean, the group not few people. Group is a, like a big group of people safe enough to to control the funds. So it's gonna be hundred hundred people or something like that. So yeah, the idea is uh, is like that. I got one thing to add here. This is how we are doing the bridge, our decentralized version of the bridge. But if some project wants their token wrapped on top of privacy chain, they can do their own bridge. And it's uh, completely up to them how they would handle the custody and transaction and the technologies out there for everyone to use. 
Yeah, yeah. That, thank you for your corrections. Yeah, to basically to create a token in Zana, like it's it's done like uh, the same way as Ethereum. It's really simple. Everybody can uh, mint tokens and uh, mint as much as as uh, mint as much tokens as they want. Mint then uh, burn tokens and do pretty much the same operation as uh, ERC twenty tokens doing on Ethereum. Another follow-up would be that technology is already live on the testnet for some time. So if anyone wants to see how exactly does it work, it's it's in our documentation and I'll be happy to help with the implementation. And maybe we can ask, is there an approximate date that we can expect this to be live? I think the last time I asked that question was by before the end of the year, which is pretty soon. Is that still the case? Yep, yep, we are on track. We don't have an exact day yet, but it's scheduled sometime in December. All right, the Christmas surprise is uh, coming very soon. Um, <laughs> I really hope that it's not going to be surprises there. A Christmas gift is coming soon. <laughs> not a surprise. So, I, mean, I, I think there's lots and lots of interesting token ideas that people will have out there. Once they realize that they can have some privacy with the tokens, I think we'll see some new things that people haven't launched uh, to date. But I think that's uh, that's one of the things that caught my attention about Zeno is there, there's not much out there in the way of other privacy token platforms or type privacy token protocols out there. So to me, this is really interesting. Yeah. Can I add a few words about this? The, there are a few projects that are doing uh, same, uh, not same, but similar things. Uh and it's been like uh, in the past few years, uh, but uh, there is a few approaches to create the privacy token in, in the privacy blockchain. But what was do done before, it was a little bit different approach with um, which not gives you uh, full privacy. There is a some naive approach that uh, create basically subset of uh, tokens inside the blockchain. And uh, with transaction, you, you you can see what type of tokens are transferred, right? But uh, you, you still have the same feature. You have a seal, for example, a ring signature and a stealth address, but you see the what color of the tokens go, uh, goes through the network. And there was a bunch of projects that was doing stuff like that at ELSO. They called ELSO uh, privacy tokens, but it wasn't uh, that private as we wanted uh, with, uh, with ZANA. And... Uh, in Zana, it the, when you see the inter transaction, you cannot say what type of tro token being transferred. You can, for example, in one transaction, you can have a Zana and some USDT tokens are transferred the same in the same one transaction, but from outside you cannot see what what are those what are these transactions transferring, what type of tokens, and this this actually even make a it's power up the privacy because it creates more like the bigger decoy set for uh, for all other transfers so all all every, so every transfer can be mixed up with uh, all all subset of other transfers and since you have a uh, tokens uh, transactions everything it's all increase uh, anonymity because it's all increased decoy set yeah so in in plain english basically what he's saying is that on the Zeno blockchain, when people are making a token transaction or a native Zeno coin transaction, all they'll be able to see by looking at the blockchain is that a transaction happened, and they won't know which token it was or which exactly. you know, it was the native coin. They just see a transaction happened. That's all they know. They don't know the amount. They don't know what what token it was. They don't even know if it was a token or the native. Yes, coin. Like, exactly. So that's a, exactly. Really a great. Yeah. That's a, and Luckily, that's... I'm a native English speaker, so I can explain things in, in yeah, yeah. native English. But. Great, great job explaining that is your second language, Crypto Spitberg. I'm, I'm always really impressed by your uh, explanation as well. <laughs> and if people are up for it, I, I see we have some people asking to ask questions from the general public. I think probably a good idea to to hear those questions yep. and, and hopefully have interesting answers to them. Is uh, all my other co-hosts uh, fine with that as well? Yeah, let's do it. Um, let's see down in the chat. We have a few, right? Yeah, so here we go. Let's uh, get the first one. Here we go. Uh, Let's see. The more people we get using crypto. Um... Yeah. Kali Gula, however you say her name, welcome. Says he's connecting. 
And I see a lot of Bitcoin cash overlap. Maybe we should do another Twitter space talking about the differences between the Zano tokens and then the new cash tokens that just went live and Bitcoin cash soon. So co colleague, uh, I, I saw you waiting for a while with a question. Go for it. Yeah, uh, Raja, thanks. I'm basically from India. This is not regarding a uh, Zeno specific question, though the space is all about that. I mean, this is a basic question to all the people here, you know, all the crypto people. So uh, I am totally up for this privacy going, okay? Uh, but the question is if there is some uh, something, you know, like theft or something like that. Then how how people gonna tackle that thing? How they gonna get their fund refunded? You know that is one question. Second question is, Roger, you are against this stablecoin concept. Better go for the privacy coin. But could you please explain what would be the basic fundamental exchange value? You know how that's gonna be set up. So these are two questions from my side to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, I had a little bit of trouble with the audio, but I think the one of the questions is what's the what's the value here? Well, clearly people love tokens already, and people love privacy coins already. So I think they'll love privacy tokens uh, when they have the chance there as well. Um, and the first question, I, I had a little bit of a hard time hearing. Maybe somebody else was able to hear and understand the the question more clearly. No, I was hoping you could. Do you want to repeat that first one or? Yeah, actually, for the privacy coin or privacy tokens, you know, I mean. If there is like uh, theft or, you know, I mean, you know, uh, the uh, what I can say, theft basically. So how are we going to get back our fund if that is so much, uh, I mean, you know, wrapped up in privacy, you know, so how to get the, get my fund back? Yeah, if, if you get scammed with crypto, you, you get scammed. So be real careful not to be scammed. I, I, I think that's the question you're asking. So. Um, that's one of the, the benefits and the challenges of crypto is that you're in charge of your own money. So be really, really careful uh, who you send your anonymous money to on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. It's even harder to track when it is anonymous. Um, so, you know, sometimes they do have luck tracking down Ethereum or Bitcoin, but you're going to have to be extra careful uh, with any anonymous coins. So it's kind of by design. So thanks for your question. Uh, and then I forgot to ask, do we have an actual hard date? Um, I know we said before the end of the year, is that, is there anything a little bit more concrete than that? Or are we just trying to shoot for the end of the year? Mm, no, no hard date, unfortunately, because we're still running some tests and we don't want to commit to the certain date until it's all done and clear. Okay, nice. That's right. All right, cool. And I see we just had a uh, Ruben Yap, uh, another longtime privacy coin fan, uh, here and joined the speaker. Maybe he has some interesting insights, as having been someone that was involved in privacy coins for a long time. Hey, yeah. Um, well, if there's no other questions, I would actually like to ask a question. And thanks, thanks for making me a speaker. And I'm a big fan of Zeno as well. Big fan of Roger as well. He's been a big supporter of Ferro for a very long time. Um, but I, I guess. I guess it's slightly off topic, but I guess very relevant to privacy coins now um, because we are facing pressure from MICA regulations, uh, you know, which claims to, you know, ban uh, tokens with uh, inbuilt anonymization. And uh, I mean, we have our own strategy. We've also been speaking with the Zcash guys on how they plan to address it. And obviously, you know, we, we understand that, yeah, you know, the, the ideal scenario is we, we always move to uh, DAX solutions with no KYC solutions. But, you know, right now, the reality is that centralized exchanges do play a big role. I was very curious about uh, how did, um, how, how is Xano planning to navigate this or you know, obviously, I know how Monero is going to navigate. It's like, you know, we, we don't give a crap and we are just going to uh, survive and, and build more decentralized options. Um, I'm assuming that's the same for, for Xano, but I'm, I would be interested to know how you navigate it, especially when centralized exchanges are under a lot of pressure uh, to, to comply. Well, in Xeno, we have auditability option. Uh, we actually utilize it for uh, important wallets like dev funds or community funds, and you can make it transparent if you want to. Naturally, we try not to do that, and as ecosystem as a whole, we would 
try to stay away. Hence, our direction towards taxes and swaps and interconnectability with other chains. But if there is a project that wants to use Sana technology to build their own token, they have all the tools to make it uh, auditable and available for Texas and whatever government to see. So just to um, get clarity on that, because obviously, I mean, one of the ways to do it, I mean, I'm assuming you're referring to uh, view keys and, you know, be, I, I know that like Monero only has incoming view keys, not outgoing view keys yet, unless uh, they move to the new Seraphis kind of platform. But one of the, the issues that I, I've been speaking to exchanges, so this might be also interesting to you, is that um, they do not want to accept any deposits uh, if they cannot identify the history of that particular uh, thing, right? So that means if it comes from an anonymous uh, thing, even if you give... so. We did speak to the exchanges and they said that, yeah, maybe you can give us the entire view key, but I don't know if that might actually be a worse privacy because that means the exchange now has access to all your history unless you choose to, uh, you know, make this wallet just for exchange use and then you give that view key to, to that. So, I, I, you know, even Zcash also originally said like, oh yeah, you know, it's fine. We're just going to give them the view key and, and everything. But uh, these exchanges, they said like, I don't know if that will satisfy their requirements. And additionally, it's actually a big privacy uh, like you're giving a lot of information to the exchange, some which I would I don't think it's realistic to expect users to maintain a separate exchange wallet just for the exchange. I mean, this is obviously some bias. I you know I I just wanted to hear your views on how you're planning to navigate it because uh, we did talk about the view keys before. We also been speaking to Binance as well. So um, obviously, whatever Binance does, whatever happens in Europe, will have far reaching ramifications to other exchanges as well. You know, I guess uh, Jesse is also here, so he would know. Um, but yeah, uh, anyway, just wanted to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah. Well, I had two points on that, and one of them probably should be Andre speaking to our auditability wallet is uh, a little bit different implementation than the view keys in Monero. And generally, we don't have such an issue with taxes because we are listed on none. So I don't even know what our requirements are. We just haven't faced those issues yet. But I, I believe we have the tools to address it. But as you said, they want to have the entire history. That obviously creates an issue for us as well, because I would not give away that much information. Andrew, can you speak on the auditability in Zana and difference to Monero? Uh, yeah, my, I think Monero uh, don't really want to have auditability. They never wanted it because uh if it little bit uh, decrease the uh, decoy decoy set uh, uh and compromise uh may compromise privacy from that perspective and uh we, yeah we have uh, we have specific uh outputs that are market that they can they it couldn't be spent with uh mixins so it's a little bit two different subsets and the auditable wallet you see not only income but also you see outgoing transfers because it's uh, always spent without mixing so you can you can trace it but it's only a, a subset so if you if you uh, create an auditable wallet it's just create a little white spot that uh, is auditable but all transactions are around this wallet they still they still private and I think the with the problem with the sex uh, right now that uh, yeah if we be honest that the privacy privacy coins even the biggest one like Monero they still have a, a not much of the volume not much of uh, use so they not really care because it's not not much profit for them yet uh, and if situation will be changed they will be more interested they probably will find. The way to list uh, to list uh, to list privacy tokens, if not coin, but the tokens probably. I don't know how they do it. They probably gonna do it uh, through the proxy. For example, if uh, Zana had a bridge into Ethereum uh, and all the tokens are bridged, 
in a safe way, in a trustless way, so they can list uh, uh, all the tokens from Ethereum or some other way. So they they will find a way to make deal with the regulations. I don't know how, but yeah, we don't make a bet on this right now. We're trying to build liquidity inside uh, Zana uh, to be in a more in a more safe uh, spot. That's that's my my take on this. Cool. I'll, I'll just add one one more quick thing, and then I'll, I'll open the thing. I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, so just just letting you know that um, when when I was speaking to the exchanges, they were saying that uh, yeah, obviously you know as a user you don't want to give up your entire history, right? But and then a lot of times regulations is always just ticking that box so that the lawyers and regulators say, okay, yes, you know, I've met this requirement. And I think one of the ways that we found uh, to kind of like do this was to actually create a, a different type of transparent address which would only accept transparent inputs. So what that meant is that because all the regulators want to see is that, oh yeah, can I plug this address from the, my, the, the address that I was depositing from, can I plug it into an uh, explorer? So if they can plug in Explorer and no matter, it might be a fresh new address, you might be unshielding from, from, from you know, a shielded pool into that address, notwithstanding that particular address has no previous history. They say, oh, I can look it on the blockchain, I tick a box and we're okay with that. So that's kind of the route we're going, which might be interesting. Obviously now, you know, may not be a priority with, with, with Xano, but, uh, you know, obviously if, if, you know, centralized exchange listings uh, are, are being looked at. Might be an interesting thing to look at. And, you know, we're, we're in touch with each other. So uh, we're happy to share more on that off, off this call. But thank you so much for giving me the, the chat and really looking forward to working uh, together. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Ruben. That's actually a neat idea. We could probably add that type of functionality to our blockchain explorer or at least see how can we make it because for now to be able to track the auditable wallet transaction you need to add a Yugi in your Zana wallet but it probably could be done online live why, why not all right and that, that's been an hour so that's probably a, a good place to wrap things up but I'm curious and excited to see what projects wind up being built on Zano and privacy tokens because the ecosystem really hasn't had uh, much in the way of privacy tokens yet. And this looks like a good chance to, to bring that to the world. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for everyone who hosted. Thank you for everyone who's building on it. Like, uh, yeah, thank you, everyone.